scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. Paul says this, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not be deprived, or do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as my, I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Brandon. A few months ago, my daughter, who is 13, going on 25, told me that a boy and a girl were caught behind the school throwing pine cones. Oh, come on. That sounds like a euphemism, doesn't it? Am I the only one who just went there for some reason when my daughter came home and said, yeah, there's a boy and a girl behind the school. They were caught throwing pine cones, Dad. But apparently, they were literally just throwing pine cones and got in trouble for that. But this whole thing has kind of turned into a running joke at our house. Like, if I ever want to escape with my wife or ever want to get them out of a room or something, all we have to do is bring up pine cones and it's great. Like, even if my wife and I just want to watch TV alone and get rid of them, we just have to bring up pine cones and they immediately get grossed out and leave the room. It's actually a great trick. But we've been in a series in 1 Corinthians where we're going through the whole book. And today we get to chapter 7. In chapter 7, there's a lot of pine cone throwing references that you need to be made aware of. And we're going to talk about it because. As we work through Scripture, there are times when what we must talk about may feel a little bit uncomfortable, but we refuse to shy away from these passages. If this is what Scripture is talking about, then we are going to talk about it. We may not always get it right, but we are going to try our hardest, I promise. So relationships are the essence of life. If you strip away all the things you own, all the degrees you've worked for, all the beauty maybe you've strived to attain, if you take all that away, when you get down to the very basics of life, it's your relationship with God and your relationship with people that matters. That's it. That's the most important, those two things. Today, we are primarily talking to married couples. However, there is a wellspring of wisdom to learn from this passage. Um, so no matter what your season of life is, if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're married, if you're a teenager, if you're widowed, whatever your situation is, there is wisdom and application here, and I promise you can get something from this today. So please don't tune out. And although today we are in chapter 7, I need you to look at the very last verse of chapter 6. If you were here last week, we talked about this. Um, and you may remember how I said that the final six words of chapter six should be like the anthem, the Christian anthem when it comes to all things sexual. So let's look at the last verse of chapter six. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20 says this, for you were bought with a price. And these six words change everything for the Christian. So glorify God in your body. So glorify God in your body. This could be the overarching theme to chapter 7. So as we travel from chapter 6 into chapter 7, I want you to keep this idea in your mind. Glorify God with your bodies. 
Have you ever been listening to a one-sided phone call where you can't hear the other side, all you hear is the one side? When my wife talks on the phone, most of the time I'm not that interested, but occasionally I'll get nosy. And as I get nosy, I'll want to hear more of the details, but I'm stuck hearing only one side. I can only hear what she's saying. So there's no way I can get all the context, all the details, all the history, or all the story. That's very similar to what's happening in 1 Corinthians, specifically chapter 7. Apparently, they had written Paul a letter or letters asking about things that may seem strange to us, but the reason they seem strange is because we have to keep them in cultural context. You see, the issue is this. We don't know all the questions they asked. We don't. But we do know Paul's response to those questions. So to keep things in proper perspective, here's something else we should know. There was a temple in Corinth dedicated to Aphrodite, who was supposedly the Greek goddess of love and beauty. The temple was known as the Temple of Aphrodite, or sometimes referred to as the Temple of Aphrodite Porne, which translates to this, Aphrodite of the prostitutes. So it was a temple full of prostitutes, about a thousand of them. And as we mentioned in previous weeks, this was a sexually inundated culture. It really was. The emperor had just married a boy in a very public wedding that the community was supposed to celebrate and be a part of. And then the men of this town would go to this temple to fulfill their lust and their desires and their needs, all while their wives stayed at home with the kids. But what I love about this passage is that it levels the playing field. Paul levels the playing field. You see, the men they would run to this temple to unapologetically fulfill their desires, all while never or rarely meeting their wives' needs. You know, the wife was there for procreation. The wife was there to have children, and that was it. Get your needs and desires met at the temple. But this was society for them. It was their normal. It wasn't strange to them. We have to also remember that the Corinthian people were fairly new to this Christianity stuff. They were new to what it meant to follow Jesus. They had a lot of questions, just like we would. They had a ton of questions. They don't have years and years of Christian heritage, like even many of us do. Like you probably, or maybe, had, a, had parents that were Christians. Maybe their parents were Christians, and it's passed down. They didn't have that. They didn't have that Christian heritage, so of course they had questions. They were trying to figure it out as they went. In fact, their guide to all things sexual wasn't Scripture. It wasn't the Old Testament, which they had a lot of. It was culture. That was their guide. Whatever culture did, that's what they did. So we need to read the first two verses. So if you have your Bible, turn there to 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to read verse 1 and 2. It'll also be on the screens. It says this. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband's husband. One of the very first questions is basically this. Here's their question. Okay, Paul, are physical relationships between a man and a woman wrong? And if they're not wrong, What's the proper context for that physical relationship? Paul, what is it? You tell us, Paul. And this question may seem odd to us today, but let me keep painting the picture of that time period. At the time of this writing in the first century AD, it's estimated that one-third of the people living there were slaves. So up to a third of people were Roman slaves. And marriage among slaves was very uncommon, very uncommon. But amongst the common people, marriage looked like this. A man would approach a father with a few goats and say something like, I want to marry your daughter. Here's some goats. And the father would say, we'll throw in a couple of cows and we'll call it good. Like that was marriage for the common people back then. But what you and I are most familiar with is like the upper class marriages. 
It's where they exchanged vows, they exchanged rings, they, they even prayed, asking their Greek gods to bless their marriage. All of that was their context for marriage. And then this guy named Paul comes along and tells them, hey, you need to live pure in that sexually inundated society. Since all this can seem so complicated, they then just ask the question, Paul, should we just be celibate? I mean, all, you're telling us to live pure, you're telling us about these relationships and how it can be bad sometimes. Paul, would it just be better if we just didn't get married? If we just stayed single, would that be better? Would it be better to just distance ourselves from physical contact and touch? But Paul basically says this, sure, singleness is good, but we shouldn't all be single. Celibacy is good, but there's something else that needs to be considered. Like, that's what he's saying to them. Paul is going to say in a second that, yeah, celibacy is good for some, but those who have sexual desires should get married. So here's what they're finding out from Paul. Marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the proper setting for sexual relationships. And I want to press the pause button right here for a minute. Because some might already be thinking this. You might be thinking, like, I knew it. This is a problem. The Bible is outdated. It's old. This church, it's antiquated. I mean, come on, it's 2023. If someone has a sexual urge, why not just go get that need, that desire met? And after all, there's apps for that. There's websites you can go to for that. If you were here last week, you'll remember that the Corinthian people they used the law to justify their actions. Because it was legal, they did it. Because it was legal to go to the temple and visit the prostitutes and neglect your wife, they did it. It was okay. But just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. And that's what they had to find out, and we need that reminder too. So listen carefully, because here's something you might not hear from a lot of churches. I believe God wants couples to experience the greatest amount of sexual satisfaction possible. That's why the Bible says the proper context for a sexual relationship is between a man and a woman who are married. Within that, embrace it. God created it. He designed it. In fact, there's a University of Chicago social, sociologist. His name was Edward Lyman. Uh, he conducted research investigating this and seeking to understand what makes a satisfying sex life? That's what he wanted to find out. And it was discovered that the most sexually satisfied people on the planet are married. Race didn't really have anything to do with it. Physical attraction didn't have much to do with it. Location didn't have anything to do with it. Age didn't impact it that much. It turns out that old people, grumpy people, they even like to have sex within marriage too. And a great sex life. Turns out what makes the biggest impact isn't looks or age or attractiveness or sultriness or education. What makes all the difference is marriage. God designed sex. He knows which way it can best be enjoyed, so he points us towards marriage. But let's read verse number three because I think you'll find this interesting. In verse number three of chapter seven, it says this, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. So if we dive in here for a minute, you can see the complete equality here. In this day and time, if you were to hear that the man has authority over the woman's body, everyone in that culture would be like, amen, Paul, that's right. The men, they're in charge and the women, we, we have power over their body. Like the men, they would agree with that in that culture. But listen to what Paul is saying. He is saying that with your body, you have a responsibility to fulfill your spouse's sexual needs. To not have sex with your spouse is to miss out on one of the greatest joys of marriage. Not even Paul wants them to miss out on that. But the men, they really did think that the more, whole, the more right thing to do was to go to the temple to have sex. Don't bother your wife with that. But then Paul comes along and is like, look, men, you have a duty. You have an obligation, a calling to be with your wife and only with your wife. You are called to fulfill her needs both inside and outside of the bedroom. 
You see the word conjugal that we just read? It doesn't mean necessarily like what we think of it today, like a prison visit, a conjugal prison visit you might have heard of. It really means to meet the needs of the whole person, to meet their emotional needs, their physical needs. Yeah, meet the sexual needs, that's important, but also be a very present spouse. Man, I love how pro-woman Paul is here. He knows that the men have been unashamedly visiting the temple to fulfill their desires, all while neglecting their wives. Paul levels the playing field. He tells the husbands, get back home to your wife. I love that. And I think he purposely addresses the men first because if it was just sexual needs that our wives had, we'd be pretty good about meeting that every night of the week, wouldn't we, guys? But there's so much more than that. They have other needs, so much more than that. She needs to feel loved. She needs to feel valued. She needs to feel safe. She needs to feel encouraged. Honor her. And if you aren't home enough, if you, if you aren't communicating with her enough, there's no way she can feel those things. So, man, you may not be running to a temple, but what are you running to? I'm not just talking about throwing pine cones either. I mean, working later just to avoid coming home or being gone every weekend just to avoid dealing with stuff at home, just being distracted. Man, I vividly remember counseling a guy whose marriage was destroyed all because he wanted to golf every single weekend and it was destroying his marriage. And now they're divorced, but he got to play golf and he realized what it did to his marriage. Man, I think Paul is calling them and he's calling us, once again, to prioritize our marriage. But at the same time, this passage doesn't leave out the women. When it comes to meeting their husband's needs, Paul also addresses that. I do believe that the men of this time were the ones really dropping the ball. I really do believe that. But there's also something pretty amazing about having a spouse that you can return to, that you can come home to. Man, having a wife who you can trust to have your back, who believes in you, who supports you, who knows you aren't perfect, but knows that you're perfect for her. Like coming home to that is amazing, isn't it? Many of you would agree with that. And I wanted to mention all of that because it breaks my heart how easy it is for us just to phone it in when it comes to our marriages. It's so easy to just let our marriages idle. I mean, it's so easy as time passes, as life goes on, as the kids get older, to just let your marriage maintain in one spot. God wants so much more for us than that within our marriages. Let's skip down to verse 4 and 5. We're kind of working our way through some verses, and what we're building to, I think, is going to be powerful. So look at verse 4. It says this, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul said something so countercultural. He was like, nope, it's not just the guy who has authority over the woman's body, the wife has authority over the husband's body as well. And we don't like this language, this talk of authority, something in this language bothers all of us because the culture we live in is a culture that promotes sexual freedom. We want to believe that we should be completely free and nobody should have any say over what we do or don't do specifically when it comes to sex. But that's just not true because last week even, we learned in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, your body is not your own. You were bought with a price. And then verse 20 that we read says, therefore, glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. So husbands, you have a duty to your wife. And wives, you have a duty to your husbands. And I do want to just acknowledge before we move on, it's important to realize that Paul is calling the married people in this room to give of themselves to their spouse. But Paul at no point is giving anyone the right to demand from their spouse or to force something from their spouse. 
So do not use this message as a weapon in your marriage, please. Please don't go home today and say, well, Nathan said this, the Bible says this. Don't do that, this isn't a weapon. You see, these Corinthian people, they had all these questions for Paul, tons of questions. Questions like this. Should Christians even marry? Is it better to just be single? Does my ethnicity matter? What if I'm a Christian, but my spouse isn't? I mean, we've got guys who have multiple wives. Paul, is that okay? Paul, we like to visit prostitutes at our temple. Is that okay? And you're going to see that in the next few verses we read, these questions are all basically what they're asking. So we're going to read a big portion here. We're going to read several verses. And I want you to look for these types of questions. You'll see them in there. And I don't have time to dive into each and every one. But you'll see these are the questions they're asking especially on this one-sided phone call that we're trying to glean from, look for these questions, and you can see kind of how Paul is addressing them. So we're going to begin reading in verse 6, and we're going to read all the way to verse 17. So verse 6 says this, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. And I love these next few words. God has called you to peace. Man, isn't so much of our life just hectic and hurried and rushed? And God has called us to peace. I don't have anything else to say about that. I just really like that. So, Verse 16. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Verse 17 is really what I'm getting to here, so let's read this. It says this. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them. If we were to keep on reading, you would see the issue of race, the issue of circumcision, more talk of divorce, even more talk of who should marry versus who shouldn't. If you keep on reading, and I'd encourage you to go home and do that today, you'd see all that stuff is talked about there. But here's the big idea. Here it is. No matter what your situation is, no matter what their situation was, I think Paul is calling them and us back to this one big idea. Live the life you've been assigned. Live the life you've been assigned. I find it interesting that the word choice that Paul uses in verse 17 is the word assigned. You see, this word, it has a deeper meaning. It means to receive one's portion. Like God assigned everybody their own portion. This is what you get. This is your portion. This is your portion. And we should never be worried about anyone else's portion. You got your portion. You received that. Use that portion. That's your assignment. You see, for the people back then, they had assignments to take care of their wives that they were majorly neglecting. Some had an assignment to remain single. That was their assignment. Some had an assignment to marry. Some had current assignments of living in a reality that they are now widowed. Some had that assignment. Some had current assignments of being divorced. The point is this. If you are single, 
don't live in a way that you act like you are married. And if you are married, don't live in a way that you act like you are single. Live your assignment. If you are divorced, live well in that assignment. If you are single, live well in that assignment. If you are married, live well in that assignment. Fulfill your assignment to the best of your ability. You see, the whole idea is really look driven home if we look at one more verse. If you just skip down to verse 24, I want you to see this. In verse 24, same chapter, it says this. So brothers, in whatever conditions, maybe we could even say assignments, so what so brothers, in whatever conditions, assignments, each was called, there let him remain with God. Remain in your condition, remain in your assignment, but remain there with God. You see, the trouble comes when we choose to live in our assignment without God. Here's the reality. You've heard the verses before that talk about how quick life is. There's a verse that says, to everything there is a season. Sometimes we must really face that reality. Right now, my assignment, my assignment in this season is this, married with younger and growing kids. That's my assignment. Only I can be husband to my wife. Only I get to come, come home every day to my four kids. That is my assignment to be a dad and to love my wife well. I have an assignment from God to do those things and to do them in a way that glorifies God. That is my assignment. Because here's what I do know. This will not always be my assignment. My kids will grow up. And though I will always be their dad, I will no longer be this stage of a dad to them. They are going to grow up in my stage, my assignment, will change to more of a mentor type role. Many of you, are, that's your assignment now, that's your stage, that's your season. Sadly though, I vividly remember getting frustrated with different seasons of my kids' lives. Like the diaper stage season. It can be so annoying changing diapers and always grabbing the diaper bag. It's so heavy, there's so much stuff in it. And usually when you need something out of it, it's not even in there anyways because you left it. It can be so annoying, always changing diapers. I remember getting so frustrated with that. Or the car seat days, you remember that? Chain, they have to, you have to go back there, buckle them in. It's never easy, and it's so heavy. You take it out, try to carry them, and that thing's so heavy. I got so frustrated in that season. I remember not being able to wait until they were past those stages. And it's almost like God had to tell me, Nathan, what do you want because every season you find yourself in, you're always ready for the next one. Out of diapers, get them out of the crib, put themselves to bed. When can they brush their own teeth? When will they buckle themselves into the car? God had to hit me over the head even this week and remind me that I should never rush through any season or any assignment because I need to live fully in the moment with each of my kids. I need to not be ready to move on so easily to the next season. Man, now I have a child that's going to be a senior in high school. How did that happen? It breaks my heart to look back and to think that I rushed through many seasons with him. Man, I'll miss these moments with him. I'll miss this season, I'll miss this assignment one day. But I also know I'm in a season of marriage right now. This wasn't always my assignment. But right now it is. In fact, it's been my assignment for the past 18 years. And in marriage, sometimes the days can be long, but the years can be short, can't they? Man, how am I 18 years married already? Some of you have me beat by so many years with that. I didn't know how much you could love a person until I had this assignment. I didn't know how much you could be loved until I had this assignment. The truth is, I wouldn't know that if she wasn't living her assignment so well. 18 years in, I had no idea that the love could keep growing. I didn't know that. Man, until you've been through some things together with your spouse, you don't know how much your love can just continue to grow. Man, when you realize that you have a spouse on assignment with you, it's amazing. I love that. 
However, here's the reality that I hate to talk about. My season may not always be a season of marriage. Many of you in this room know what I'm talking about. You now are back to being single. For some, it was an untimely death. For others, it was an unwanted divorce or maybe even a needed divorce. But regardless, your assignment changed, didn't it? You know what Paul would say to you? He would say, live your assignment well. You may not like your assignment. It might really hurt. It might be the hardest thing you've ever had to do, but live it well. Don't grow in bitterness because of the season you are in. Look, I know that I will not live on this earth forever. At some point, I will leave my wife behind or she will leave me behind. And as sad as that is, as much as I'm going to dread that moment, our assignment in that season will have been completed. And whoever, whomever is left down here, whether it's me or whether it's her, that person will have a new assignment. And do you know what Paul would say to that person? He would say, live your assignment well. You know what he'd say to a person who is single, who keeps getting frustrated that things aren't changing, and you desire and long for something else because you think that you so badly need to get married or find that person to feel like a complete human being? You know what Paul would say to you? He'd say, live your assignment well. Please don't fall into the trap of thinking that you are incomplete without another person. Man, sometimes we tend to think that because the Bible says the two shall become one, that must mean that we all are at 50% complete until we find our other 50%, and then when we come together, we're a whole person. But that's not true at all. You are 100% complete, loved, fulfilled, and very significant as you are. Don't look for being fulfilled by another person. You know what Paul would say to you? Live your assignment well. Husbands, wives, are you living your assignment to your spouse well? It, it may not be a temple of prostitutes you're running to. It probably isn't. But it's easy to find ourselves running to other things for satisfaction, running to other things other than our spouse. You know what Paul would say to us? Live your assignment well. Perhaps your season is one of divorce. Um, it's your, your fault or not, your decision or not. If you find yourself in that situation, live it well. Man, handle it like a true Christ follower should. Keep taking the high road. Do the right thing. And as Paul would tell you, live your assignment well. Maybe you're in a blended family now. And it's a new assignment, but it is an assignment. Live your assignment well. This could all seem so doom and gloom. Like I just talked about dying and my spouse potential. Like that's sad stuff. It, it could seem that way, and it does, and I agree. Apart from heaven. Man, it would seem so sad, the thought of not being an, on this earth to fulfill my assignment with my wife by my side, it is heartbreaking until I remember that I am not storing up treasures on this earth. My treasure, my reward is in heaven. I heard a story a few weeks ago from a pastor who's telling it to a congregation or a group of people, and it was at a conference I was at, and some of you might have even heard it. I think some of you might have been there. I think you were. And I don't even know if the story's true, but the point of the story is very true. Um, the story goes like this. There was a missionary couple who spent their lives overseas investing in a group of people on the mission field, spent their lives over there. They they're buried some of their kids over there, gave their life, went through some of the hardest things ever. The best years of their life were spent serving these people overseas. And they're finally coming back to the States. They're finally coming back to the United States. And they're tired and they're wore out, but they gave the best years of their life and now they're ready to walk into their sunset years. And on the ship they happen to be on as they're returning, President Teddy Roosevelt happens to be on that same ship. And he was known for being a hunter and loved hunting. And he was on one of his hunting trips. And they're returning, and right as they dock into the States, the president has to get off first, and everybody has to wait. 
And they see President Roosevelt walking off the ship and just being greeted by throngs of people. And the fanfare he's receiving is amazing. People are wanting to touch him. They're wanting his autograph. And here this little missionary couple is standing to the side of the ship, seeing all of this, but seeing nobody there to greet them. This president just went hunting. They gave their life. They had an assignment on the missionary field to live that, and they did. They lived their assignment well, and they're returning home, and nobody's there to greet them. And just as the husband is getting discouraged and sad, the wife leans over to him and says, Honey, we're not home yet. (laughs) What a powerful statement. Because that reward wasn't there when they docked. Their reward is coming. They're not home yet. Their reward is in heaven. I would say they lived their assignment well. And I would say to us, and I would challenge all of us in this room, to live your short assignment well, because eternity is long, and here is short. So let's live for the few short years we have on this earth with eternity in mind. Most of all, let's live our assignment well, and by doing so, we will reap the rewards in heaven. So would you close your eyes and bow your heads, and let's pray for a moment. And in just a second, I'm going to give us the opportunity to respond to this because we all have assignments. I think it's appropriate to take a few moments and see how we're doing within those assignments. And I'm going to pray for us, and then in a, after that, I'm going to invite you to stand, and maybe you need to grab your spouse and pray with her or him. Maybe you need to come down front and meet God down here. Maybe you just need to dive into this idea of your assignment. How are you doing with it? Are you living it well? Because Paul would tell us, live your assignment well. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, first of all, for my assignment, for the one you've given me, for the wife you've given me, for the four kids you've given me. God, may I live that assignment well. And God, forgive me for the times where I've rushed through seasons, where I just wanted to get through it. God, I pray that I would not rush this assignment, but that I would live it well. God, for all of us in this room who have assignments, would you help us not to grow bitter in that? Help us to spend a moment, convict us where we're not living it well. God, help us to live our assignments well. In your son's holy name we pray.